welcome dear participants to the third module of the sixth week. In the previous module, we had discussed about Adorno and Horkheimer's views on contemporary culture, particularly on the culture industry. In this current module, we would continue with this discussion and would also extend on these critical approaches. Adorno and Horkheimer have been critical of the sameness of the products of culture industry, which is against their idea of authentic art. They say that culture industry allows only the freedom to choose what is always the same. It is interesting to refer to one of the statements by Adorno when he says and I quote, every visit to the cinema leaves me against all my vigilance stupider and worse. So, we find that Adorno's criticism of film as a product of the culture industry is not only limited to the production of the sound systems in a film, but it goes beyond that. The film as such had been a product of the contemporary technological innovation, but at the same time there had been certain non-graphic elements which have also been used and built on in the movies. And these non-graphic elements of films have had societal histories as well as clearly discernible and explainable social roles outside the films, for example, music. And Adorno's views on these non-graphic elements of the films helps us to understand the ideological operations of culture, which ultimately result in the cultivation of a particular type of an individuality. These views can be seen in a book with the title of Composing for the Films, which has been co-authored by Hans Eisler and Theodore Adorno and it was published in 1947. As we have already seen, Adorno has been critical of the sameness and the formulaic presentation and production of products of the culture industry. He has, he has said that though the films are capable to present certain closeness to the reality, but they also blur the divide between the reality and the artifice and they use different resources for that. The technological resources are there, but at the same time the aura of the film stars, the star system is also used to blind the people towards the reality of life. He also says that the element of music also is also used to produce this type of sameness in the ultimate production of the movies. He refers to the jazz and the popular music which do possess predictable notes and chords. The predictability of music and its soothing and calming effect on man, an effect which dulls the mind and therefore soothes the mind can also be seen in the portrayal of George Orwell's famous book 1984 in which he has de depicted the dumping effect of the songs which are being continually played by the big brother over there. So, consumer is lulled into a sense of security through the predictability of these notes, the predictability of these sounds and it is exactly the same aspect which has been delineated very sensitively by George Orwell in his novel 1984. So, Adorno says that everything in the movies is expected and the tastes are predefined. So, there is no appeal to the criticality of the audience as far as the products of the culture industry are concerned. They are consumed uncritically and therefore, they suppress the cognition, the thought patterns of the viewers also. The culture industries are capable of turning rationality against itself. The rhetoric of the culture industry is very clear because they say that there is nothing which is at stake because these industries are ultimately only entertainment. But Adorno is able to show how these entertainments are not simply entertainments at the superficial levels and how deeper meanings are attached to them. According to him, the culture industry 
and the entertainment which is provided by them frustrates the actual needs and desires of the people and promises them false hopes without actually delivering these promises to them at any moment. It impairs any effort at critical distance from immediate gratification. So, Adorno was one of the very first critics to point out the harm which immediate gratification of the desire through the medium of art is there. And according to his, this immediate gratification of the desire in the context of the products of culture industry stunts the inquisitive faculty of the people. It questions whatever is less saleable and therefore, the more demanding logic that lies behind authentic art is automatically frustrated. The culture industry produces only what can be consumed at a bigger level, at the level of the masses and therefore, instead of the individual differences, it banks on stereotyping things, stereotyping products and therefore, stereotyping the desires for the mass production and the cultivation of false desires among the audience. So, all popular culture according to Adorno simplifies and caricatures and therefore, it results into a death of originality not only in the artistic products, but also in the creative minds of the audience. It is because of these reasons that he has talked about culture as a way of deceiving the people. His idea of culture industry as a force of mass deception has had a significant impact on the left wing understanding of political theories. According to him, the culture industry totalizes its audience and it exposes the audience to a permanently repetitive yet unfulfilled promise. And I quote, the culture industry perpetually cheats its consumers of what it perpetually promises. So, it establishes a cycle, a cycle of creating a desire in an artificial manner and also repeatedly frustrating this desire is at the core of the culture industry and therefore, this industry is a tool of mass deception. So, culture industry is designed to deny or even prevent imagination, spontaneity and critical thinking among the people and thereby it protects the interest of the capitalist. Adorno has also written about the passive form of consumption and production and he says that the culture industry methodically processes its audience. Consumers of the audience are not individual human beings to this industry, but rather they are only numbers in a game of statistics. So, they represent the consumers on the research organization charts divided by various details according to their income groups into different areas. So, this is a technique which is used for any type, any other type of propaganda. So, by using this technique in a methodical manner, culture industry is able to process the audience and therefore, it denies the benefit of any individuality to the audience. It results into a social subordination, which is the only imaginable mode of subjectivation even on the side of production and this is organized from above. So, since the capitalist forces are also organizing the culture industry into a force of mass deception, Adorno feels that there is perhaps no freedom for the individual. Unlike the theories which have been presented in the same realm by Benjamin or Brecht, we find that in the model of Adorno, there is no freedom. Rather, this is a very straighted model which has been presented by Adorno and Horkheimer. They have worded the culture industry as an apparatus of seduction. According to them, it not, it not only produces art products, but it also creates moods and emotions among the audience by focusing on certain type of presentations through the art forms and also by creating artificial desires. And it is not only the consumers, not only the audience who are the slaves 
of this totality or ideology, but the producers themselves are like the cogs in a bigger apparatus. The producers also have been shaped by an abstract system. So, the human subject or employees are beholden to institutions and they do not have any independence or freedom in any way. Adorno has also talked about the advertising and has also said that the logic which he has presented for the culture industry is also applicable to the advertising field. And he particularly says that the assembly line character of the culture industry is also very much suited to advertising. Because of the synthetic and planned method of turning out a product, for example, it is a factory like uh, production not only in the studio, but also in the compilation of different types of pseudo documentary novels, hit songs, the cheap biographies, the cheap serials, the musicals etcetera, which are being designed by the culture industry at the level of mass production. The important individual points are made detachable, interchangeable and even technically alienated from any connected meaning which they perhaps had originally. So, they have been decontextualized and therefore, they are also being used uh, particularly for the purpose of advertisement. So, the method of culture industry, the method which they had adopted from the assembly line production of the contemporary industry is also very clearly discernible in the field of advertisement. He also says that advertisements create desires among the people in order to sell their products, in order to maximize their profit. So, advertisements are also tool of manipulation. They do not advertise the merits, but they somehow focus on the creation of artificial desire among the people. And therefore, it is an information which is being disseminated for a specific end, but this specific end is always the profit. And profit is the ulterior motive which lies behind different facets of the culture industry. It may be the musicals, it may be the advertisements and it may be the production of a movie or the writing of a novel etcetera. But we find that it is about the placement of a particular product in a particular context to maximize the profits. So, somehow the desires are created among the audience which suggests to them that the ownership of a product is a way to achieve success and happiness and that if one owns a particular product, it would enhance the success, the happiness or a sense of achievement. So, the desire is created among those consumers who are already passive and therefore, the advertisements create a demand where none should have existed originally. So, the artificiality in the creation of desire for the purpose of a capitalist motive of earning profit is deplorable in the ideas of Adorno as well as Herkheimer. So, in a way we can say that the self perpetuating logic of commodity fetishism is behind these particular designs uh, of the culture industry which have been critiqued by Adorno. Adorno has also talked about homogenization and pseudo individuality of the products. He says that basically the products are duplicatable. Uh, there is always something for everyone and therefore, there cannot be any genuine creativity because things are being produced at a very big level. They are being automated and therefore, we find that there is a basic homogeneity in the products of the culture industry. The changes which are visible to us are only minor changes, cosmetic changes and the illusion of choice is being given through the dissemination of standardized and homogenized product with slight variations and differences. And therefore, this also is a part of the culture industry and mass deception. There is no real diversity 
and the monopoly market ensures that only the big and the powerful corporations survive. And each product is advertised as being unique by them. However, we find that this is only a pseudo individuality, something that would appeal to an individual consumer in the mass production means that a product is unique, but it would also simultaneously appeal to millions. So, culture industry according to Adorno cultivates different types of mass deceptions and these contemporary pictorial presentation also confirm a popular version of Adorno's statements. So, Adorno in brief has discussed the concept of the culture industry and its applications in media also. Media according to him is also not independent anymore, but then media content according to Adorno is adapted to mass consumption. Content is made to appeal to the widest section of the people and to achieve this mass media has combined different forms of cultures. It has combined high and low culture and it has blurred the boundaries between the two. So, masses are perceived as objects of calculation. The culture industry dilutes the consumer into thinking that the media is adapted according to his needs and produces this illusion to strengthen its influence and control over the masses. In actuality, masses simply receive the content that furthers the ruling ideology. So, culture industry also banks on the pliability of media as Adorno has commented. Culture industry is interested only in sustaining its affinity to capitalism because the profit margins are the source of its living. So, the impact and power of media has also been utilized by the culture industry and therefore, the lack of neutrality in the media and the nexus with the capitalist monopoly should not be taken lightly. It functions on the illusion of being informed and involved, but we find that people are dependent on the opinion of the media and therefore, the illusion of the freedom of the press or the freedom of the media does not allow the people normally to be critical of the people. On the other hand, we find that the culture industry uses the media to disseminate a particular type of product either as a source of pleasure or as a source of amusement or it passes on a particular type of information to boost the sales. In a way, we find that culture industry propagates false values with the help of the media and preserves its control by selling the illusion of the good life as reality. These perceptions demote the value of authentic culture. Happiness and the dreams of happiness which the culture industry sells through media are ultimately imaginary. The American dream which has been popularized in Adorno's time with the help of the media ultimately is void. It does not have any real foundation because it talks about happiness, equality and prosperity. But this focus on American dream hides the actual relations of production in American society and the disparity between the rich and the poor. This cartoon also suggests that the culture industry basically sells a particular dream. It prompts the people to work harder to earn money, but to earn money in order to buy something the desire for which has been only artificially created and it pushes the people into a do loop in which the consumerism is directly linked with amusement. Consumerism is directly linked with one's definition of success also. So, it is this type of a culture, the industrialization of culture, the commodification of culture which has been critiqued by Adorno and Horkheimer. The works of Adorno and Horkheimer have also come into a lot of criticism. People say that it is an elitist view because they have defended modernism against mass culture. Critics also feel that Adorno and Horkheimer have exhibited an ignorance of actual popular 
culture, they hated jazz and they refused to recognize the political elements of pop culture, which was also being commented on in the contemporary critical world. And they have also refused to recognize the existence of various subcultures simultaneously in any given society. They have overlooked the fact that the culture cannot be exactly homogeneous. So, they have ignored this particular aspect as well as they have ignored the reception and think that the audience is only adjunct to the machinery. So, they have simplified the production of culture and wholly rely on the argument of the monopolization, the conveyor belt production system image which does not represent the full picture. So, there has been an over determination in their argument and to say that the culture shapes our mindset and attitudes to that extent which has been presented by Adorno and Horkheimer sometimes seems far fetched. So, the criticism of Adorno and Horkheimer also suggests the limitations as well as the over emphasis which is present in their ideas. Another critic whose work is important for us in this context is Walter Benjamin. Walter Benjamin was also a contemporary of Adorno and he was also associated by the Frankfurt School. All these critics who were associated by Frankfurt School condemned the contemporary world view as we have already seen, but at the same time their world view was also structured by the contemporary affairs. So, we cannot dissociate the feelings and the thoughts and the critical arguments of either Adorno or Walter Benjamin from the contemporary world view. So, Benjamin thought that the totalitarian and genocidal state was not merely a problem in Germany. He saw it as a western problem and felt that it was rooted in the enlightenment urge to dominate nature. Benjamin was also associated with the Frankfurt school and he had also tried to escape Germany. And unable to escape these forces, Benjamin had committed suicide. So, we find that there is a strange mixture of ideas and arguments in Walter Benjamin, which puts him sometimes very close to Adorno, but at the same time sometimes very dissimilar to his thinking. He feels that with its salvo of propaganda and controlled entertainment, Nazi Germany could be seen as an archetypically modern society. Because he feels that the anti-Semitism which is being practiced by the Nazi Germany was not merely a manifestation of hatred towards a particular sect of people, but rather it had to be viewed as a means to an end, as a means to obtain a particular type of a decisive and driving force for societal control. And therefore, he felt that totalitarianism is not only a particular issue with the Nazi Germany, but it is a western problem which is rooted in the enlightenment urge to dominate nature and have a control over it. And therefore, he felt that the outcome of the second world war which resulted in the defeat of the Nazi Germany was never fully satisfactory. He according to him it fell short of a final defeat of fascism and the totalitarian mind prowled everywhere and the American culture was also not able to escape it absolutely. Walter Benjamin is particularly known for his essay with the title The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction which was published in 1936. Benjamin discusses a shift in perception with the rise and development of film and photography. He has talked about mechanical reproduction as having brought a major change in the contemporary culture. And he also says that the way people look and receive works of art has completely changed with the intervention of the technological development in the areas of film and photography. He also feels that the human perception is tied to the historical changes and it changes over the passage of time 
it cannot remain static and therefore, he has made some very interesting comments about the modern age and about the way the popular art forms have to be perceived. He has drawn our attention to the effects of modernity on the work of art in particular. We have already discussed how Adorno looks at two types of art products. He looks at what he calls the culture industry and he contrasts it with the genuine or authentic art forms of the history years. According to Benjamin, we find that the development of film and photography are not necessarily evil forms, but then they have resulted into a loss of an aura through the mechanical reproduction. He says that an authentic and original work of art possesses a certain aura. An original painting has an aura, an original sculpture has an aura, but a photograph of the same painting does not have it because it is only a mechanical reproduction. And since it is a mechanical reproduction without the aura which was possessed by the original painting for example, it also has become closer to the common man. Benjamin states that the traditional function of art was rooted in ritual and therefore, it was associated with a cult value and promulgated the notion of aura that derived from the authenticity of the work of art. But the effects of modernity have taken away this aura. The films, the medium of films and the photographic representation of the art form have taken away this aura. But this taking away of the aura is not necessarily a poor influence on the contemporary people. According to Benjamin, the privileged notion of authenticity was also responsible for preventing the masses from a closer scrutiny of the art form or the criticism of a particular art. The aura stopped them from approaching a particular art form in a very close manner. However, the mechanical reproduction in the film or in the medium of a photograph enables them to scrutinize an art form in a clear manner. So, he argues that the mechanical reproduction of art destroys this notion of authenticity and the related aura and thus frees up art from its traditional uh, function as a cult object only. In freeing art from the domain of tradition, we find that Benjamin thinks that mechanical reproduction allows art to be based on the practice of politics rather than ritual. So, we find that this accessibility of an art form with the help of modern day technology is a particular way of looking at the art product which is very different from the viewpoint of Adorno in Horkheimer. According to Benjamin, we find that the democratization of art forms as they become easily available to the greater number of people lies at the heart of the revolutionary potential of an art form, particularly an art form like film which can also be viewed easily by the people. So, it promotes the revolutionary criticism of traditional concepts of art and mass mobilization as well as the democratization of an art form also has certain therapeutic roles. It also has the capability to pass on a particular message to the people in a revolutionary fashion and he refers to the early Mickey Mouse cartoons of Walt Disney. He has also raised political questions in regard to the reproducible image which can be used in one way or other. He has also referred to some early Charlie Chaplin movies for their content and the capability of generating a particular sentiment among the people. So, in this new age of mechanical reproduction, uh, nature of film and contemplation of the screen is very different and he says that it is not the individual who contemplates the film per se, rather the film contemplates the individual. Film brings a change in the structure and in the mode of perception and the camera both replicates and departs from the function of 
human eye. So, through this medium so, sudden scene changes can be presented, close ups can be presented with the help of different camera movements, slow motions etcetera. A particular type of perception of a scenario of an emotion of an art form etcetera can be presented before the people and therefore, it is very different from the function of the human eye. So, the film according to him produces an experience of shock, it is a bombardment of visual stimuli and filmic devices can therefore, also contain this initial moment of shock. They also affect a mode of viewing that instills a sense of heightened attention and which can be used in different ways. So, we find that his assessment of the effects of mechanical reproduction of the art form is relatively optimistic. It is very different from the assessment of the culture industry as presented by Adorno. Benjamin has attempted to reconcile materialist and theological concerns. As I had said earlier, these critics associated with the Frankfurt school were not absolutely dissociated from their own world view. So, in Benjamin's work we find that there is a strange mingling of the Marxist tradition of social critique and the Jewish mystic tradition that he was drawn to under the influence of his friend Grisham Sholem who was a Jewish historian. And it is this mingling which has given a sense of hope in his criticism of the contemporary culture, a sense of hope which is very foreign to either Adorno or Horkheimer. However, despite his sense of optimism, we find that his inclination is very close to that of Adorno and his comment recalling the sumptuousness of his family, which has been recorded by Eileen and Jennings in the recent biography of Adorno and Benjamin in several volumes proves. Benjamin belonged to a well to do family and this early uh, recollection of his life suggests how closely he was looking at different issues. So, we find that Benjamin used to critically look at these concepts of ideology and identity formation as closely as Adorno did. Benjamin's reflections on film, technological reproduction as an emancipatory force alongside the proletariat collective nature of such transformation are different from the views of Adorno. Unlike Benjamin, we find that Adorno insists on the negotiation of collective experience by the individual, whereas Benjamin had focused on the collective nature of such transformation. However, we find that in our age of global and digital proliferation of images and sounds, the issue of organization and politics of sensory perception is still important and therefore, the issues which have been put forward by these critics associated with the Frankfurt school related with ideology, the processing and formation of individuality and identity are still very valid. As the homogenization of culture progresses in our day and the control of technology maps out our movements continuously incessant, incessantly, such voices confirm that identity is formed by what surrounds us. In short, our identity is formed by our culture and it is this discussion which we would continue further in the rest of the modules of this week and we would look at certain literary productions to go deeper into this idea. Thank you. Music